The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in a room, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked upon his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm and has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, For he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The Gospel of the Lord. Sometime in my many years of teaching religion to eighth graders, I gave a test to a class on Mary. So the questions were something like, who's the mother of Jesus? Mary. And who's the angel that appeared to Mary? Archangel Gabriel, the outline of the rosary, and so on. We came to the question, what is the assumption? So I'm grading the tests. And I noticed that this one boy is not doing very well. He hadn't studied very much. So when it came to that question, what is the assumption, his answer was, I assume I have failed this test. (laughs) True story. And (laughs) I said, you assumed properly. So anyway, but the assumption is that Mary at the end of her life was taken body and soul into heaven to share in the glorious life of our Lord, a life that is promised to each one of us. Why do we believe this? Well, we've always believed it. We can go back to the early centuries of our church fathers, even during that time of Roman persecution, and this is what they believed. So we look at our sacred scripture tonight, and we glean through all these different passages. We go to the book of Revelation, where St. John had this vision. Very complicated book, because it's like this eternal, everlasting life scene. Past, present, and future, all working together. So consider this. God had a plan for salvation. Adam and Eve, we know, had committed their sin. That original sin. Suffering, sin, death came into this world. But God had that plan, and in his mind, he had prepared our Blessed Mother to be the Mother of the Savior. To be the Mother of the Savior, who is true God, Jesus, second person of the Trinity, who would become true man. So in God's plan from all time, he had the idea of Mary. 
Well, Mary was born at the proper time. She was born free of all sin, even original sin. She was full of grace, prepared to be that mother. She then conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And through her, Jesus, true God, became also true man. In, book, in John's book of Revelation, he, we see this opening of heaven. And there's the Ark of the Covenant. And the next verse is, there's Mary. Mary's the Ark. When we think of time, eternal time, Mary's the real Ark. Yes, the Ark of the Covenant of the Old Testament held the Ten Commandments, the priestly staff of Aaron, some of the manna from the Exodus event. But Mary is that ark because within her womb, she is going to hold Jesus, who is the Word who became flesh, who fulfills all of the law, all the prophecy. He's the priest who will offer his sacrifice for our sins on the cross. He is the one who is the bread of life, the Holy Eucharist, who has come to nourish us. So Mary is that ark, that ark of all time. Well, with that then, we think of how important Mary is just because she's the mother of Jesus. But then we also have to consider the important role she played as the faithful disciple. The very first miracle of our Lord is the wedding feast of Cana. Jesus hasn't really started his public ministry yet. Mary intercedes, seeing the need. Jesus performs that miracle because his mother asked. Then we have Mary at the foot of the cross. She's standing there again, not only as mother, but faithful disciple, realizing our Lord is taking on that whole burden of sin, sin of all time, past, present, future, onto himself to reconcile us with Almighty God. At the same time, though, she has become our mother. Jesus looks down and says to St. John, Behold your mother. To Mary, behold your son. And then comes Easter. Now, at Easter time in the Gospel, we don't hear of Mary specifically. But I believe, and Pope St. John Paul II agrees with me, that Jesus, <laughs> Jesus must have appeared first to his blessed mother to show that he had risen. Yes, to show his mother, but also to show the faithful disciple that he has risen from the dead and given us the hope of everlasting life. Then at Pentecost, Mary is there with the apostles, the Holy Spirit descends, and here we have the birth of the church. So here we have this blessed mother Mary, who from the very first moment of her life has been full of grace, who's been that faithful disciple. So at the end of her life, we believe that the promises given to each of us by our Lord, that one day we would share eternal glory in heaven in a glorified body-soul union were fulfilled in her. At the end of her life, she was assumed body and soul into heaven. Another point of proof, one could say, is that in the early church, they often venerated the tombs of martyrs, but there's no tomb really for Mary. It's empty. So if you go to the Holy Land, there's a church of the Dormition, where Mary fell into this death-like sleep. There is the church of the tomb of Mary, but it's always been empty like the tomb of our dear Lord. So we believe in this dogma, this truth of the assumption. But what great hope we have. So therefore this night, we should not simply assume that we go to heaven, but rather we commit ourselves again to being that faithful disciple and striving to live a life of grace. We rely on the example and the prayers of our Blessed Mother. I encourage all of you again, especially during this 100th year of the anniversary of Fatima, to heed the message of our Blessed Mother. Pray the rosary each day. We need to look upon the face of Christ through the eyes of Mary. By praying the rosary, we can be drawn into an intimacy with our Lord. So the assumption then is 
a promise of hope for all of us. That if we are that faithful disciple, if we strive to live the life of grace, then one day we, like our Blessed Mother, will be united with our Lord fully in heaven, body and soul. What great joy that is. So how good it is to see all of you here this evening to celebrate this solemnity. Let us take the solemnity to heart, recommit ourselves, and promise, looking to the example of Mary, to be like her. May God bless you.